This is your five minute warning. The first keynote of performance days, hello everybody. The first keynote of performance days is one, personally, I am chuffed that we've been able to bring here. I am an academic, or I'm meant to be an academic, and occasionally I bump into people who I'm so glad, because they are the future of the industry, and Kate's gonna make me retire, because she knows a lot more than me. Now, I'm trying to encourage Kate. Kate's a bit nervous. She doesn't like being on stage, so she won't like this build-up. She's gonna start talking in about four minutes' time. The project which they're on is a commercially supported project. Performance fabrics are seen as leading the way for the general textile and fashion industry. What they have done, no idea. without taking away the whole of their talk, is they've looked at a $4 t-shirt, a $40 t-shirt, and a $140 t-shirt, and other variations. And they've looked at them for quality, and also the amount of love that the user gives them. They've started to address the churn, Churn is the single biggest product that this, industry ha that this industry defaults on. We do not make products that people love enough. Or is it the world with its marketing messages continually telling us we must buy new on a regular basis? It's a really good question. And this is where the research is focused. So in about two and a half minutes, Kate and Mark are going to start on, the, on their findings on the durability. Those of you who don't know Mark, I teach beautiful things. I do performance sportswear design. Mark does the technical side. Mark's students now populate some of the best brands, potentially the best technical course in Europe. I don't know if we've ever, ever bothered to look at the world, Mark but it's where the interesting people are from. We've just got a new first year turned up from Hawaii <laughs> and she spent two years trying to find somewhere, anywhere in the world she could study sustainable fashion and there isn't anywhere except Leeds. She obviously didn't find the course at University of East London, but let's be honest, who wants to go there? We can't talk too much because Kate's going to get really annoyed that we're not talking about her, her project. Mark has educated me. He's brought me on. Mark is a regular at performance days. We are honoured to have him correct me. He's already corrected me this morning when I was talking about membranes. So I'm going to shut up and in about one minute's time, Kate and Mark are going to start on their findings. They're going to host questions afterwards, but if you don't want to ask a public question, you can also pick on them. They're both here for a couple of days. So yes, one minute's time, Kate and Mark will kick off. So this uh, session is going to be a bit interactive. And so we're going to use an online tool called Slido, which requires you to go to a website, which is Slido, S-L-I-D-O dot com. And then when you get asked questions, you can put in a room number and you can type your answers into your phones or whatever. And then we can get them. And that way you don't have to embarrass yourselves by saying something you're not confident about, but we can still get those responses. So please do. Then there'll be another point where we ask your opinion on some garments that I've got here. And that's where we just want you to shout out your answers. But if, you're not, if you don't shout out, it's not going to work. So please get involved. Is it time? Yeah, I think, I think. so. So I don't know if we missold all this to Charles, but you're not quite getting what Charles described, although some of it's in there. So, um, as Charles has already said, I'm Mark Taylor. I'm Kate Morris. And Kate's doing a PhD at Leeds, looking at durability. She's a year in, but she has worked on some of the other work we've done. So me and my colleague, Mark Sumner, are now on our fourth durability-related project. Um, started off with I think for the BBC looking at t-shirts, then we did something for a very big UK based value fashion retailer. And then the thing that you might have seen in the news recently from the UK that was done with Hubbub and Primark. Um, and we'll see some results from that in a little bit. But this is what we're gonna do. Um, talk a little bit about 
different definitions of durability and how you think you might assess those. And we will illustrate this with examples from our recent um, projects. So why? Why is durability important? Is it important? Does it matter? Well, if your garments last longer, then when people do get bored of them, they can maybe give them away or sell them, and then they can carry on being used. But even if you just think about if the end of your garment, at the end of its life, is just going to be recycled, if it's so not durable and it just wears out and there's nothing left to recycle, that can't be recycled, can it? So clearly durability is an important thing. And the EU thinks it's important. It's got a raft. I reckon there are about seven directives and regulations coming in the next few years from the EU that are going to directly impact all of you if you're in brands that are going to try and force circularity on you from different sides. There's like forestry directive that's going to say you've got to use trees for your viscose that have been grown properly, that type of stuff. It's, you know, um, but all of that impacts on circularity and some of it obviously is clearly related to durability. In fact, they're talking about things like rules that say you have to make your garments more durable. Without any particular definitions for that, but these things are, are definitely coming. Got the same in the UK. The UK government's having similar conversations. But also bear in mind, if you're a UK brand and you want to sell in Europe, you've still got to comply with those regulations and directives, even if we aren't in the EU anymore. Because it's if you want to offer it for sale in the EU, you've got to meet their rules. So it still applies to you regardless, wherever you are in the world. Um, and as it says at the bottom, it's quite a complex issue. Everybody thinks they know everything there is to know about durability, but as we found in reality, it is not so simple. I'm going to pass you over to Kate now. I sure I click that. There you go. Okay, cool. So through our research, we've come across quite a few different definitions of the word durability. Um, so we kind of want to hear your opinion of what you think durability means to you. So as Mark said, we're going to be using Slido for this. So if you just go on your phone or your laptop, um, pop in Slido, and then this is your room code here, so 31556, and the question should pop up. Um, you can just pop in a couple of words which you think kind of embody durability. Um, it's a really interesting kind of way of doing it because people usually have very different answers and um, while you're kind of inputting what the words that you think mean um, durability, we're just going to take you through what we've kind of come across through our research and how we're going to define durability today. Um, so the first part of it is to do with physical durability. Um, this is probably what most of you will kind of come up with when you think of the term durability. It's to do with the wear and tear of our clothes, so how long they can last without having holes in them or the seam bursting um, or the kind of couple of examples that we've got up here. And then the other side of that, which is probably the lesser known part of it, is emotional durability. So this is all how, about how we actually make emotional attachments to our clothes and what they start to mean to us as we kind of keep them for longer um, and wear them for longer. So if it has a strong emotional attachment, it's going to remain relevant to you and desirable. So you're going to want to keep on wearing it again and again. So hopefully that's enough time for you to kind of put your ideas down. I can see some people have put the room code in the thing. Um, so when you go on, there should be a box. If you want to just pop in, if anyone's still doing it, a couple of words that mean durability to you, that would be great. I'll give you another couple of seconds. Um, 31556 is so big because it's like a word cloud and lots of people have obviously put that in, so it's getting bigger. Yeah. <laughs> So I'm not really surprised because, as I mentioned, the emotional side isn't as known, whereas physical durability is a lot more of kind of the buzzword that you would think of when you think of durability. So a lot of you have put like long lasting, quality, strength. These are kind of all terms that we would associate with physical durability opposed to emotional. Um, someone's kind of already picked on it, like saying they love their stuff. Obviously, that's a very re emotional response.
some odd ones there, though, isn't there? Yeah, a couple of new ones I haven't seen before. Age and beauty, that's a nice one. It's a nice way of putting it as well. Keeping something for longer and your attachment is going to grow over time. Old friend, that's another emotional... Yeah, it's great to see quite a good mix of um, like physical aspects, but also emotional like memories and sort of the social acceptability and everything like that as well. So you can see that durability really does mean different things to different people. And that's why it's so interesting to see because there's not really a wrong or right answer here. It is really like personal. So I think if we'll move on and just going to go over a couple of terms that we think are quite important to just properly define when we're talking about this subject. So, so firstly, we've got longevity. Um, and this is basically the active lifetime of your garment. Um, and it can be measured in a couple of different ways. So you've got the years that it's owned, the number of wears, and especially going into like number of users now that the secondhand industry is growing even, even more. Um, it's really quite a complex term because depending on the metric you use, you can kind of come up with a very different answer. And I'll give you an example of if you had two people that owned the same garment and one person had it for 10 years and one ha had it for two years, you would say the person who had it for 10 years has a higher longevity of their garment. However, if you look at those same people, 10 years and two years, and the person who's owned it for 10 years have actually only worn it 20 times, whereas the person who's owned it for two years has worn it 200 times, they've actually got a lot more wear out of their garment. So you can just see by picking the correct metric, you'll get a different way of sort of looking at it. Then we've got utilization. Um, most people will associate this with wearing your garment, but utilization could literally be anything to do with using it. So how you store it, how you wash it, how you dry it, that all kind of comes under that umbrella term. Then we have lifetime, which is just very simply the years that it's been owned for. A minimum standard, so if you're here, um, representing a brand, you probably have a minimum standard that you need your garments to adhere to before they kind of go on the market. This really varies um, across brands, which is something through our research really surprised me. Um, everybody has a different way of kind of looking at it for different garment types as well. And then we've got ma uh, maximum product performance. So this is essentially the breaking point um, of your garment when it's sort of um, tested to all these different life stresses, um, it's the point in which it's going to break down. So that's the maximum performance it's going to hit. So they're just a few terms that hopefully are nice and clear now. I'm going to pass back over to Mark to take you through sort of the real life example that we've been looking at. So yeah, if you're thinking about physical durability, how would you assess that? What metric do you use? Does, it, does anybody do this? Anybody out there do, do any durability testing? Some brands do, don't they? I know, I think Patagonia have got a, a wash durability test. Can't remember just how many wash cycles, but they wash it a few times. Um, should we be thinking about modes of failure? Is that important? How does your garment fail? Is that what you should then maybe investigate as the route to durability testing? I don't know. Well, I do, but um, can tests reflect real life? Can tests reflect real life? Mark, do you mind if we heckle your answers? Go on. I was going to say the Martindale is our default as an industry. Is it worth it? Is the Martindale like real life? No. But is anything. If you do, you'll see in a second, if you do 56 repeated wash and dry cycles, is that real life? No, because they haven't been worn in between. But you trying to get into replicating the real life of a garment using people becomes a real challenge because what if they use it differently? I wear the same pair of jeans, I do everything in them. I'll crawl under my car, I'll crawl under my motorbike, I'll do DIY in them, whereas other people would take the jeans off and put a different pair of trousers on for that. So, you know, it's very, very difficult. So, and obviously we have to have standards for everything. Because the reason we use a Martindale for abrasion testing rather than asking people to rub their bums across a, a rock is that you need it to be the same abrasion every time. So you have a nine kilopascal weight and you have a standard abrade and, and these things. And it's the same here. 
So this is a real world example. This is taken from a, a thing we've done recently. You'll see some results from this. And this is what we decided were important for denim jeans and cotton t-shirts. And you'll see they're different. Clearly they have a different use, don't they? So the endpoints are gonna be different. Martindale abrasion, or what we've got here, these, this is from a British standard for work wearing uniforms, which we thought was a, a good starting point for denim products, jeans, because jeans are workwear, aren't they? Or they were originally. Um, and this is, it says retail, it shouldn't say retailer really, it should, I think it's because Mark used to work at M&S and he's pulled some of these from M&S and they're a retailer slash brand, but these are standards from different brands um, and what they've set their minimum performance level at. So 20,000 revs on a Martindale. Now when we did this for Primark and we took the jeans to destruction and they said, don't do that, stop at 50,000. So what, how can we tell you which is the most durable pair if we don't actually wear a hole in them? And we won that argument. Well, we, we did it anyway. I don't know if we won, but we just did it. Um, do you notice quite a few of them do line up? But then, what's your dimensional stability requirement? Does anybody know theirs? No? 3%, 5%? Does it matter where it is? Does it matter with the direction? These are just things to think about. This is what we pulled out, and this is what we did. And you, in a bit, you'll see how it, it panned out results-wise. This um, is probably the most important one. This is domestic wash-dry cycles with regular visual assessments to see how they change. But before we move on to seeing some results, uh, is it me that's not clicking this hard enough? <laughs> this is where we want your interaction. We want to divide the room into two. We'll put a line down the middle. We'll have Alex that side. And it's not quite the right base layer, but a polyester base layer and a waterproof jacket. What I want you to think about is what you might think, test it, think about for testing on these garments. These aren't jeans, these aren't t-shirts, these are more performance related. So what would the modes of, modes of failure be that are likely to result in these ending up in a dustbin or a landfill site or an incinerator or wherever they go to, yeah? Obviously, you don't have to wait for the gamps to get to you. The idea was to throw some out, but you've got pictures. Does it matter that it's a Paramo jacket? It is a Paramo jacket, but does it matter? Polyester base layer. So this is where you want to shout out. There's no slide on now. It's shout out some answers. If you want to heckle, heckle. If you want the microphone, stick up your hand. Come on, you make waterproof jackets. What's the mode of failure? What would make somebody throw it away? If it's not waterproof. Delamination. Wetting out. It's a really important one. Anything else? Who makes base layers? Pilling. Everybody know what pilling is? Bubbles, whatever they call it. You've got a smell here as well. Smell? Yeah, heckling. Smelly Ellie. Intelligent people at the back. Husband smell. <laughs> Does that not make you want to keep it longer? So it smells like your husband. You get him mostly. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> so, lots, some different answers. Not a lot, but they're very different, aren't they? You wouldn't throw your T-shirt away for the same reason you throw away your your base layer. These were our thoughts. Um, Obviously, holes lead to a failing of the waterproofness. Would you repair it? As a paramo, you could. They offer an amazing repair service, and it doesn't have a membrane, so you can't spoil it by sewing a patch on it. But if it was something else, maybe sewing a patch on it doesn't work so well, and repairs are harder, not so easy to do at home. Repellency. Charles touched on something this morning. The chemicals used to offer DWRs are just not as good as they used to be. And probably never will be again because it's to do with chemistry and you can't change the laws. Doesn't matter what anybody tells you. If they tell you they've got a 
DWR that'll do you a, a spray rating of four after 50 washes, I'll tell you now, they're lying. You just can't do it. So what does your customer do when it wets out? Have you given them the information that lets them know that there are things they can do maybe to bring repellency back? Do your customers trust that? An old student of mine, Philippa, she did a survey a long time ago and about 10% of the respondents said they didn't trust the reproofing chemical manufacturers and thought it was a scam. So when their jackets wetted out, they threw them away and bought a new one. Which is quite terrifying, isn't it? Base layers. We did get order. We predicted that answer. Pilling, we think, is a big one. Colour change, potentially. If you bought it because you like the colour, and then all of a sudden it's no longer that vibrant orange, but now it's some sort of dirty, mucky, pastely orange, would you still want it? Uh, and again, holes. If it gets holy, do you want to wear it? So now, I think just before I do move on, the main thing to bear in mind is it's different uses. You probably wouldn't care if this pilled. It wouldn't pill anyway, would it? But maybe it's a big thing on this. Some of the fleece industry found out about years ago. Maybe not as well, Okay, I agree. Maybe some people don't care. It depends why you bought it, because if it changes massively and it's no longer nice and it's it's your outer layer that's showing off. Because you've got to bear in mind, pills change the visual appearance, not just because they're pills, but they change the way the light interacts, so they make it duller and greyer in appearance. Um, but back to our real world example, I mentioned it had had a little bit of press in the UK. We were in Ecotextile News, we were on the BBC. Um, because we did all this work for Hubbub, but it's a, a PR company, I think, but it was on behalf of Primark. And I, I can say it because they're named here somewhere down here um, and they were interested in the relationship between price and durability and that's something we've done quite a lot of work on in the past and these are some results color coding can be misleading because if you look here if it's green it was equal to or above the average if it's red it's below the average does that mean it's rubbish who wants to be brave enough to tell me that a burst strength of 188 newtons on a cotton t-shirt is rubbish. Yeah? So it might not be. <laughs> it's just below average. Um, so these are just cotton t-shirts, ladies t-shirts. We did a lot of men's t-shirts. We did hoodies, men's and ladies. And we did denim jeans, men's and ladies. Yes? Specimens, minimum three for each test. The washing and visual assessment was squillions. We pulled samples out. So we have, as new, after... After wash. After that, we don't, we don't only have 56, so we've got some pulled out at 20 or so we've got them pulled out yeah, at Yeah, a stages. couple of different intervals as well. 16 different garments and many replica. replica yeah, so this is a style yeah. with our okay. code. The, the, the visual assessment after laundry, that's based on 56 wash cycles with, I can't remember how many of each garment went in at the beginning, but because we pulled up, we got a brand new pair, we got a pair after five washes, got a pair after, I don't know, just wash, 20 washes and one after 56 washes, so we can lay them out and we can see how it progressed, how the visual assessment changed over time. All of these tests were done on three specimens from each garment. No, we'll come to that in a, mi in a minute. A big, a big price range. Um, but these results are great, but what does it mean? And one of the things that we were asked to do was to rank this. How would you take this data to rank it? Which of these is the most important factor? Anybody? Visual assessment. Yeah, we thought visual assessment. But what's, what's your next most important one? Oh. Oh, well, just, I'm just a slide behind myself. Um, basically, we had to decide if some of these are more important. The numbers at the bottom tell you how we thought they ranked. There is a number two missing. I'll talk about that in a second. And this particular exercise, because everything did all right and colour fastness to wash in, we didn't include it in the ranking. Potentially a mistake, because when we did this the first time for the BBC, a very expensive t-shirt had a massive problem with colour fastness. 
but in this particular study, it didn't, so we didn't. So visual assessment was number one. Number two was at what number wash cycle it got to this level of change. So did it get there quickly and then stay and plateau, or did it take a long time to get there? Uh, for T-shirts, we thought pilling, and again, um, rate of change of pilling. So this is final result. This is the point at which it made its first full grade change. So it went from a five to a four, basically. So the one at the top never did. It only ever changed half a grade throughout the whole cycle. So that's how we, we ranked them. And these are in order now, aren't they, Kate, from the best at the top to worst yeah. at the bottom. So somebody asked about cost. Who wants to have a guess at which is the most expensive T-shirt? One at the top? Number two? Number one? I think it's number four or five. It's that one. So the cheapest wasn't top and the most expensive wasn't top. But there were some very expensive t-shirts at the very bottom of the pile. And there were some very cheap ones, maybe higher up than you expected. So not that it means anything. The, the purpose of this was this brand wanted to demonstrate that you don't, the, the, the adage we have in the UK that you get what you pay for isn't always true. Because it clearly isn't. Um, what else does it tell us? Well, this costs a tenth of the one at the top. £22 at the bottom here. You might have thought that would be better, wouldn't you? But it's rank, you see. When you looked at dimensional stability, some of them changed an entire size over 56 wash cycles. So if it shrinks a full size, it won't fit you anymore, will it? So that you can't wear it anymore. So you'd throw it away, maybe. So important consideration. Sorry, Kate, go on. A question. Um, obviously, this is all measuring physical durability. Were there any measures of emotional durability? So if we plotted what's in on trend against this, or... No. Because, I mean, you could say, yeah, it's cheap, it's well it's good performing, but if it's the wrong style next year, then the utilisation is completely... Absolutely. It's a good point, but it's not something we could look at in this study, but something Kate's going to be doing over the next few years. Yeah. Yep. Another question, just, just out of interest. Did you also have anybody physically wearing the T-shirt so you get the wear in between as well? No, that's, as I said earlier, that's just so difficult to try and do mm. in a way that's repeatable and reproducible, and that's when you're trying to... One of the, this was a precursor to Kate's PhD, and we'll talk about it right at the end, but Kate's PhD is partly sponsored by RAP, which is a UK organisation, charity, that's, that's trying to reduce waste in the, the whole industry, not just fashion, but everywhere. Um, and what they're trying to get out of it is some form of protocol. Yeah. They want to inform their existing protocols, maybe improve them. Oh. And so we've got to try and do it in a way that can be reproduced by other people and you can't do that with yeah. wearer trials so easily. Yeah, it's a shame because you miss out the husband smell. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Well, you miss out that wearing in between as well. Mark's been very casual about it. Um, rap is a major influence on UK textiles. Rap is responsible for the Sustainable Clothing Action Plan, which was the forerunner to the European Clothing Action Plan. So it's a pretty powerful organisation. I have, I have two questions actually regarding the stability. Um, you have like a good, uh, bad and everything. What do, how do you define good? How do you define bad? And also another question regarding the composition of the t-shirt. Is it like 100% cotton, 100% polyester mixed? They were 100% cotton t-shirts. Yeah. They were all 100% cotton. Um, the, that rating was based quite a bit on our experience of working with industry and knowing what brands will and won't accept in the fashion area. So it, it does vary on, uh, um, 
in the length and the width, they have different requirements, but uh, from memory, it was 3% and 5% are, are what we might call acceptable. So if it gets above that, anything that's rank a full size gets a poor rating because clearly it's no longer going to fit the, the owner. I did answer that, answered both. Anything else before we let Kate carry on? Yeah, go on. Hold on, Christine. Don't let us know your names in the audience. We pick you out. <laughs> um, I have a question of understanding also. Uh, for the pilling, what was the number? It was like 6,000, 7,000. Can we go back one slide, please? Um, 7,000 is the mm. standard Martindale pilling cycle, isn't it? With yeah. the, I can't remember the weight now, but the weight and the, the pilling set up. Ah, okay. We did, we did wonder if anybody asked why we did Martindale and not one of the other pilling tests. And obviously nobody has, but you, you've touched briefly on it. Um, so the standard Martindale test, if everybody knows it, 7,000 cycles, the, the same fabric above and below, and they rub against each other repeatedly. There are other pilling tests that involve tubes, rubber tubes and sewn samples and bouncing around in cork boxes. But although the test itself is relatively quick, preparing for them and setting them up takes a long time and you can't do as many specimens at the same time. We've got 14 Martindale heads that we can run simultaneously. We've got two pill boxes. So that, uh, that's why we went down the Martindale route. Um, and if you look at the literature, you'll see that pillboxes are often criticised. It's why James Hill created their snag pod, because their pillboxes give unpre uh, unrepeatable results sometimes, and they're not very reliable, whereas the Martindale's better. So we, we did think really hard about it. But So 7,000 is the answer. Cool. OK, we'll move on. Um, hey, don't so rush. We've still got half an hour. OK. Um, so as you picked up on, that project didn't really encompass anything to do with emotional durability. So that's what I'm starting to look at within my PhD. So we're going to talk a little bit about that now and how that kind of fits into the topic of durability. Um, so again, we want a bit of sort of participation from you guys. Um, and the question is, what makes your favourite garment your favourite garment? So I'm sure you all have one garment or a few garments that you usually gravitate towards, you put on, you feel amazing, and it's just something that you'll always kind of keep coming back to and wearing. Um, so if you want to get out your phones and laptops again, we'll go back to Slido. Um, it should be the same room code, different question. And it would be good to know just a couple of the different factors that make your favourite garment your favourite. Um, I think what's interesting about this question is it, it actually can change over time. So what your favourite garment is today that you're thinking about might not be your favourite in a month's time or a year's time. Um, and that's something that I'll go in a little bit more depth in about as we get on. I like that answer. Time eight. They made it themselves. There's always one person that can't spell. <laughs> Being nationalistic, Mark. So you can already see that we've got quite a lot of different answers. So it's not really like a one fits all kind of question. Um, so there's a lot to do with sort of com comfort and fit. Somebody Snoopy? want to expand on this? Is just because it's a Snoopy T-shirt or something? Yeah. <laughs> is, that, is that you as well then? <laughs> few people picking up on like material as well soft wool that's one that's not usually picked up on actually fits well so fits coming up mm. um memories 
and hand me down. These are ones that we expect to see. So it's interesting. Where's the other one? There was one. So we've got timelessness, timelessness over there, but yeah. we also had something that matched it on this side of second. Uh, that the, these things are, they move around. Uh, timelessness, timeless. Patriotic. That's a new one. I'm big on the memories one. This is quite new, this. I've only had this one a few months. But I only buy T-shirts at concerts. So then when I'm old and in my dotage, I can look on the back and figure out where I was. So I did have some really old ones, but they fell off the back of a truck when we were moving out. So at least that's what the wives said when the box went missing. So the oldest ones I've got now are from the mid-90s. So Pink Floyd at Earl's Court and uh, Halloween in Bradford. Right. I think we're going to move on, but I think that pretty clearly displays that everybody has a different reason for like loving their garments. Just one second. Does, yeah. does somebody want to tell us what this actually says? Because... No? No. Oh, well. I'd love to know. We'll have to just get in Google Translate later. Okay, so... These are kind of a couple of the main themes and factors that I've found through my research that affect durability, and that will be affecting both physical and emotional durability, because how we're looking at it as a whole, a lot of research in the past has looked at either the physical factors or the emotional factors and haven't looked at it together. Um, so that's what I'm trying to do, and bring it all together. Um, so firstly, we've got product parameters. So this will encompass anything to do with the product integrity, so itself, so composition, uh, fabric structure, garment construction, and even the colour. Um, so this will probably more affect the physical durability, and a uh, garment is only as durable as its least durable components. So we kind of need to make sure what we are creating is durable enough to last. Um, or but the product parameters will also affect emotional durability as well. And a good example of that is colour fading. Uh, if you take something like a formal shirt and the colours faded dramatically really, really fast, someone might not want to wear that because they're trying to wear it in a formal setting. They want to look smart and it doesn't look smart anymore. So that's when product parameters can really affect emotional durability. Then we've got product care. So not only is product care massive sustainable um, considerations, it makes up a one third of the carbon footprint of clothing. Um, it or also has a massive impact on clothing longevity. So product care encompasses things like washing, drying, um, the type of detergent you use, if you use conditioners, um, the temperature that you use in your washing machine, and washing frequency. So the tumble dryer and washing machine, the abrasive action of the drum is going to degrade your clothes. So the more you wash them, the quicker that's going to degrade over time. This is an area where consumers can do a lot, I think, to keep their clothes lasting longer. Um, then we've got demographics. That obviously encompasses quite a lot of different groups. I'm just going to focus on um, age and income, just because of time today. Um, so if you're looking at a generation or point of view, a lot of people kind of blame the younger generation for things like overconsumption. Um, and RAP have done a recent survey where they found that 81% of the younger generation buy a piece of clothing every month compared to 21% of people over 65. So I think that kind of confirms that maybe the younger generations are the ones a little bit more involved in fashion and are buying more. Interestingly, when you look at income, it's actually the people that are earning more that are buying more, which seems like an obvious statement because they've got more disposable income. But what interests me is if the younger generation aren't usually the ones that are earning that kind of big money. So I think there's kind of a little bit of a gap there about the research and just looking more into that and actually maybe what the younger generation are buying because it's probably cheap stuff. But as we've already said, there's not actually a correlation between price and durability. So it's an interesting one to kind of keep looking into. Then we've got fashion. Um, by fashion, I mean trends. Um, so I think a good example of this is I hope m most people will have heard of Barbie film or have seen it. Um, and when the Barbie film came out, a lot of people were going out and buying pink clothes just to wear to the cinema. 
But the question is, are they going to wear those clothes after they've kind of done that one trip and got the picture to put on Instagram? So it's kind of like, what are we doing with those clothes when we've kind of worn it once, hit the trend, and it's moving on? Trends are moving so fast nowadays that you're not really getting enough time to actually wear your clothes and fall in love with them. Um, so that is obviously going to affect the emotional durability aspect too. Then we have human psychology. So this incorporates things like self-identity and the value that we put on our clothes. Um, so we all use clothes as a way of communicating who we are, whether you think you do or not. Today you picked out a certain outfit to wear here and you're obviously trying to convey something with your outfit. We all do it. Um, but over time, our personalities and our self-identity changes and with that, our style usually changes as well. Um, and so you'll go through a kind of overhaul of maybe buying new clothes, regardless of whether your clothing that you have at the moment actually is, might still be physically functional, but it just doesn't really reflect who you are anymore. Um, so that will be a big reason why people kind of get rid of stuff. Um, investment value is another reason where emotions kind of come to play as well. If we've spent a lot of money on an item, we, it'll either go either way. So someone will wear something loads and loads of times because you want to get the worth out of the item that you've bought, or they'll hardly ever wear it because they're scared of ruining it, getting something down it or a hole in it. And so it will just sit in their wardrobe and they don't actually touch it. So there's a different way of looking at that. And then you've got sentimental value, which a couple of people picked up on the Slido, things like memories or it's been passed down. We've put some sort of value on it that it just is irreplaceable. Um, and that's another reason why people will keep something. And it's one of the only factors where emotional durability is actually far more important than physical durability. A lot of the time with a sentimental value like item, it, it could be almost in tatters, but we still want to keep it because it means so much to us. Then we have life changes. So this can encompass so many different things. You might have a new job, you might have just become a parent, you might have moved house, um, changes in your body, things like that. So this can affect both physical and emotional again. So if you take, for example, maybe um, your body size has changed, but you're still trying to squeeze into a piece of clothing, you're gonna put additional pressure on the seams. It's likely to fail a lot faster than it would have if you had a garment that maybe fit you better. Um, and then if you take emotional aspects, say you've just got a new job, um, you might want a new outfit for your sort of first day, regardless of if you actually have something in your wardrobe, but it might look a bit worn, but you really want to look crisp and make a good impression on your colleagues, you're going to go out and buy something new. So again, all these little things are, are kind of maybe an unconscious decision that you're making, but are going to affect the clothes and the behaviours. Um, then we have price. Obviously, we've already touched on that. Um, a low price doesn't necessarily mean low durability, but unfortunately, consumers still do think that. And they are going and buying things that actually could last a long time, but they're just not putting that value on it and giving the time to actually make that emotional connection. Um, they're very happy to wear it a few times and then they're like, oh, well, it only cost a fiver, so if I don't wear it again, it's fine. When actually, they could wear it for a lot, lot longer. And then finally, we've got evolutionary psychology. Um, out of interest, just raise your hand if you've ever actually heard of evolutionary psychology in the context of clothing durability. So nobody. OK, that's new. It's a new topic for everyone then. Um, you're probably thinking I'm crazy bringing evolution into this, but I'll give you a bit of context. So it can basically be used to explain why we pick certain pieces of clothing. Um, so basically, we're obviously very social creatures. We want to make friends and kind of fit in. And to do this, a lot of the time, we unconsciously use our clothing to fit into a certain social circle. And by doing that, it actually brings a lot of evolutionary advantages. So it might be that you um, are going to meet your partner, your mate, through the social circle. Um, and obviously, then you can have kids, um, which a support system obviously helps. So there's a lot of obviously evolutionary advantages in that, and it can be used to explain individual differences. Obviously, this is a very primal way of looking at it. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, the research shows that the younger generation are more involved in fashion. And the reason 
that might be is because they are actually trying to find a mate, so they're more involved in how they're presenting themselves and the clothes that they're wearing to go out and do that, whereas the older generation have already been and done that, so they might not necessarily be as interested. Um, so it's just a, a completely different way of looking at like clothing behaviour completely, and I found a really, really interesting topic and not one that's been explored a lot. So hopefully I'll be able to do a little bit more of that in the next couple of years. And Kate talked about price. She touched on a really important thing, and going back to that project we did for Primark, that's what one of the things they were trying to do, and that's the reason why there was so much publicity was trying to persuade people who'd bought cheap garments from Primark that they could keep wearing them and didn't have to throw them away because it is a challenge getting that across to customers. And we have this problem in the UK called the Primark effect where people buy it, wear it once and throw it away because they don't think it's worth washing. So, sorry. So hopefully you're kind of getting the message that physical and emotional are go together. You just can't look at them separately. And there's a couple of examples where a physical factor will actually become an emotional factor. So I've got a couple of examples up on board here. So we've got creased shirt, pilling, and color fading. Um, these garments are still functional. They might be a little bit faded, they've got some pills on them, or they're more creased than you would like, but they're still functional. You put them on, they're going to keep you um, warm, they're going to you know, be functional garments. But people decide to throw them away for these reasons. So it's an emotional response to a physical factor. Um, and so a lot of the time when something like this happens, people won't necessarily want to throw it away because it's, it's not actually at its end of life. So they'll just put it in the wardrobe and it will just stay there. And this is called virtual divestment. So it's the act of keeping something but not using it at all. And I think the majority of us are guilty of doing this. Um, in RAP's recent survey, they found that the average person owns 118 items of clothing that have not been used in the last year. And I'm sure everybody, if you think of your wardrobe Sorry, now. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody owns 118 items of clothing. 26% of it hasn't been used in the last year. Oh, sorry, that's, that's my bad. Right. Yeah. So, well, a quarter of your clothes, that's still quite a lot, right? That's a big statistic. Um, Who? So. Who doesn't have something in the wardrobe that they never wear? Does that make sense? We all do, don't we? You've, you've got no clothes in your wardrobe that you haven't worn for ages. That's impressive. Wow. We can all take have a look you out your had a clear out? Oh, wow. Anybody else? No. I've got some. I've got some T-shirts when I was a bit smaller. I'm desperately trying to get back down to that size. I'm getting close. So I will wear them again. It's not a good thing though. We don't want people just keeping and hoarding their clothes and not wearing them. There's a couple of reasons for that. For one, it doesn't necessarily mitigate a purchase. Just because you own something and you've got it in your wardrobe, it doesn't mean you're not gonna go out and buy something else. But equally, by having that in your wardrobe, you're not allowing someone else the opportunity to buy it from you or um, and wear it again and have another life cycle. So it's just stagnant clothes sat in your wardrobe. So if you do have anything in, I would encourage you when you get back home to kind of go through things, donate it to charity. There's so many different like secondhand platforms now that you can use and hopefully we can get those clothes back into circulation. So, the policymakers would have a belief that everything should be more durable. Is this true? Should every garment you make be much more durable? Is, that, is this a mantra we should all be going with? Can anybody think of an instance where it maybe shouldn't be? I don't want my freshers t-shirt to last a decade. I don't mind if it wears out after one month. The example we thought of similar. You get these shirts that you have made for your mate stag do or a hen do. Will you ever wear it a second time? So if that's a durable shirt, it's, what happens to it? Odds are it can't be recycled because of the PVC or whatever they used to stick the badge on. So it's just landfill or incineration or in the back of a wardrobe because you'd want to remember the stag do, but you don't necessarily ever want to wear the shirt again. So there are instances where we shouldn't just insist on massive durability. It isn't always the right solution, although it often is. Because the other problem is, it, take it to a charity shop, who's going to want to wear it? 
unless they happen to have a friend with the same name as your mate who's getting a stag do on a similar day in the same town or whatever. But it depends just what you put on them, doesn't it? So, what's next? Well, Kate's got to finish the PhD. He's got another two years to go. It's fully funded, so we're not asking for money or outdaft like that. Don't, don't, don't get worried. Um, it's more than fully funded. The university is paying for it, but RAP have put even more money in, so we can... Well, we've employed a technician to help her and there's loads, so she's fine, she's sorted out. Um, the intention is that the work we're doing can hopefully help to inform the policy makers and the legislators, because the worst thing that can happen is they start to pass laws that make you do things that don't make sense, because the odds are they're not textiles people. And it's possible that the people they are talking to have a vested interest, because you know, if you happen to work for a company that makes a particular type of product, you're going to want it to be favoured, aren't you? Maybe. I'm just a cynic. Um, and consumers, they do need to be educated. It's really hard though, isn't it? Because they're not interested. But this idea that with the Primark effect, how, how can Primark persuade their customers to try the garments for a bit longer and not just throw them away because they were so cheap? Or at least try and donate them. But we have a problem in the UK. Oxfam, one of our biggest recyclers, they collect and resell. They don't want garments from brands like Primark. They don't have a value in their stores because if they're two pound and two pound fifty new in Primark, how cheap does it have to be in an Oxfam store? So they usually end up selling those abroad, which is a bit of a contentious issue, isn't it? In Romania, people love Primark clothes. There are charity shops in Romania that their big selling point is the British flag. We'll come back to you in a sec. Um, and. Are you all aware of this, the behaviour intention gap? If you ask people, your customers, about how sustainable they are, you'll probably get really positive answers because nobody, even in an anonymous survey, nobody wants the thought that their answers might make them look bad. So everybody wants to be more sustainable. I want to recycle my clothes, but when it comes to throwing them away, do I really want to take a bag of them down to a bloke to get, who's going to offer me 50 pence a kilo? It's not worth my effort. So I'll just put in the bin outside my house and then they won't get recycled, that type of thing. That's what we're talking about. So we've got to work on changing this. And again, it's back to consumers. It's about you dealing with the consumers. So brands like Zara now have their own app where you can sell Zara clothes to other people second hand. In the UK, at least, it's coming to France and Germany later, but they trialed it in the UK first. Um, Zara take no money from that. It's not like an eBay or a Vinted that take money. That's, it's a free service they offer, but via an app to sell their, their garments. So it's another way you can help your customers to, to close that gap, maybe. Just things to think about. So now we're open to questions. Is that working? <laughs> um, I was going to say, there was um, a big bit of research done a few years ago by Oxfam. Um, I have a friend who used to do all their education side. And through a massive piece of re research with a company called the OR is present as well. And it's actually only about 30% of what we donate to charities in the UK that gets processed and sold in UK charity shops. The rest of it gets bundled up and sold in bales in places like Cantamanto Market in Ghana um, or ends up in the Atacama Desert. And that's that's like the Western world. It's, you know, it's, it's all of our developed countries. It's really, really shocking figures. So make sure that if you're going to donate something... I think got Oxfam hold. try really hard to make sure it doesn't end up in those places now. So they, But once they've sold it, yeah. they, they lose control over it. But yeah. they do try hard. Absolutely. And I think the, the prime kind of culprits are the donation bins at the side of the road as well. Um, but it's always worth going into your local charity shop and asking if you can look through the bags for scraps. Because as, as you just said, like, a, it would just be like an unbranded T-shirt and it hasn't got a brand on it or it's a Primark or it's, you know, it's perfectly usable, but it just ends up in the bags for scraps. It yep. just gets shredded and turned into mattresses. Yeah, it's a good point. For those who are really sad, if you have decent stuff put into charity, it at auction will range from three to five hundred pounds a ton. If it's scrap, it's thirty a ton. So there is a vast difference. The good news is the thirty means they aren't paying the landfill tax, which is why people do it. But I'm we're, I'm I'm here searching for questions. Or thoughts, uh, anything, any comments? I'd love to say Mark and Kate, 
Tell no, us what don't. we're doing they wrong. They don't. They want to learn. Kate is a life PhD. <laughs> she is always open to new influences. It's the better lines of thinking she wants to tune into. If you think we've done something wrong, tell us. No, nobody. Colin, always oh, a chap at the back. Need to talk to you. Hey, uh, I wonder if there are any ideas to give the end customers um, some kind of a number, a standard, to actually have an idea how long-lasting and how good or how bad a textile is. As we all know, and you, uh, you have shown it again, uh, the price is not an indicator. So how, how are people choosing when it's not the brand or the price? I think it'd be very difficult to tell people how many times they can wear it or wash it um, because everybody's point of disposal will be different. I'd probably accept a different level of, level of colour change maybe to, to you or to somebody else in the room. Um, well, it's interesting, wraps existing protocol. You wash a t-shirt 56 times. How many times do you think you wash a pair of jeans? Guess, anybody? More? More, less? much what? more. No, it's much less actually, is it? Yeah, it's 30. 30. Now, I, I struggle with this, I don't understand. All right, you wash your t-shirt every time you wear it, maybe. We should be discouraging that, people probably do. So, um, so you wash your jeans less often, but don't our jeans last a lot longer than our t-shirts? Unless you're me and you've got 30-year-old t-shirts, 40-year-old t-shirts, but for most people, the jeans last longer, don't they? So, I don't, I, I don't quite understand why the, the much lower amount of washing on denim, but uh, that, that is a fact. So they wash jeans 30 times and then you, you do an assessment and you decide whether that's, it's durable enough or not. But as we've already seen, very few of the brands that are here have volunteered a, a number that they wash things to decide if it's durable or not. It's not something that... Mark, could I also make the observation, I think you and I buy a fairly simple pair of jeans rather than a trendy jean. The work that I was doing with Wrap, I was amazed how trendy you can make jeans. The more trendy you make it, the faster it goes out of Yeah, action. actually, so the last time we did a trial like this, the one that we reported earlier, not, not the one Kate's doing, it was for another value retailer, might be in the same one. Um, they wouldn't let us publish it at the time, but they, uh, similar amount of jeans, loads of jeans, but back then, pre-dirty jeans was a fashion. So people would go into a store and buy a pair of jeans that look dirty. So when we did the visual assessment, it was a real challenge because sometimes that dirt came off on the first or the second wash. So then what you had is a nice clean pair of jeans that to me look better. But if you bought them because of the way they looked, then it's failed, hasn't it? Or has it? But yeah, just interesting. Go on, there was a... I was just going to ask if any of your work that you're doing now for your PhD is going to include any research into warranties and what brands perceive as their optimum warranty. There's a lot of variation from, I speak as a brand, but I, when I look at our competitors, there's such a wide range, whether that's material warranty versus constructional warranty or user warranty. So I wonder if any of your research is actually going to feed into that and that would be actually quite useful because our perception of durability from a constructional perspective or from a material perspective is very different to what consumers perceive to be durable. Kind of indirectly, we're looking at creating a minimum durability standard, basically, because as you point out, all different brands are testing to different things and how can we compare how durable something is or know really how durable something is. So part of my research is creating a protocol that we can kind of present to all the brands and say for different garment types, this is the minimum standard you should be adhering to. Hopefully, if we can get to a point in the industry where we're all kind of following the same protocol, you won't have that issue with different warranties because everybody should be working towards the same thing. So that's the kind of ultimate aim of the project. Yeah. Uh, I've just inherited a project from another university that failed to finish it. It's a bit sad. I won't name them. I'll just be old. Um, and it's working with a kids wear brand who want, they wanted to know how, what 
they have to do to be able to make the same claims that George has to make, for, which is basically a lifetime warrant on kids' wear. Um, and there isn't an answer because George Asda might not have done out. They might just make that claim knowing that the returns rate will be really low and they sell a shed load. Um, but this brand wants to better make the same offer, but they want to better back it up. And, and well, really early days at the moment, but we'll, don't know. But it's, it's a tough one because Kate's right. We, we, we got a standard durability standard. So we have a, a standard durability requirement, but it doesn't help people set their warranty periods. So it's something that's going to need to be thought about. Just one question. Um, you didn't mention uh, any reparability. Uh, do you think we could also include reparability in the durability equation? I think dur reparability fits massively into the circularity question, and durability is a big part of circularity. But I think they're, I mean, we mentioned it briefly, didn't we, with the waterproofs, that if they can be repaired uh, and you can maintain the function. But you've always got a problem then, back to the emotional thing. Um, my older daughter, she used to have a teddy bear and she loved it. Went, wouldn't go anywhere without it. And it got run over by a car and its eye got lost and its nose got lost. And after that got repaired, she never loved it the same because it wasn't the same bear. And I think it can be the same with garments. If you've got a, a shirt you really love or a pair of jeans and it gets patched, you can no longer wear them in the same situation because it's got a patch on. And that depends a little bit on your social circles and stuff like that, obviously. But so repairability is important. And it's an important part of circularity, but I'm not convinced it's a huge part of durability. Although it's really, it is in there, but. I think it's dinner time now, unless there's any more questions. I'm looking around for questions because you've got the opportunity, Mark. Um, for those people who don't know, uh, University of Leeds, they're a rival university to my university. And perhaps I'm bigging them up a bit too much. Um, the third member of the team, the supervisor, is not here. You've heard him referred to, Mark Sumner. He was MNS's Plan A guy. We have Mark the Technical. Um, in my opinion, it's the best research university for textiles in Europe, potentially the world. If you really want to know what's going on, University of Leeds is worth it. We're lucky in that the university I'm at, which is not Huddersfield, but the three of our universities... Did, did I say Huddersfield? Or did I didn't. I said Huddersfield. But the three, the, us three universities are all in a working group, the future fashion factory or whatever. But I'm s filling for questions and I can't see anything. So can I ask us all to show our appreciation for Mark and Kate? 